so okay, in the previous lectures, we've been talking about um, hearing assessment and the different tests that we use to, te um, to assess the peripheral auditory system and the middle ear and the inner ear. In this lecture, we'll talk a little bit about the, some of the common disorders that might affect um, the peripheral auditory system. There is a multitude of um, conditions that might affect hearing and, uh, but in this lecture, we'll focus on just a few um, of these conditions that are c common um, and, um, and how they may affect the hearing. So we'll talk about the disorders of the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear uh, in the following slides. The oracle or the pinna, uh, as I said, plays a very small role. Uh, in hearing per se, uh, it's more cosmetic, and um, and the malformations that we typically see in, in the auricle or the pinna may be um, found from birth, uh, maybe congenital, or it could be because of trauma, um, either because of an accident or um, trauma resulting from surgery. Uh, as I said, it doesn't result in a significant hearing loss, although some recent studies have shown that the uh, pinna, the shape of the pinna and the indentions in the pinna may play a role in some localization. Um, but um, it, if the disorder is primarily only in the pinna, uh, it would not result in a sensitivity or, uh, or a hearing loss. Um, some conditions that might affect the pinna uh, might be categorized into microtia. Microtia means um, miniaturization of the pinna. It might be some um, syndromatic conditions might have um, uh, microtia. Or uh, in some cases, it might be anosia. Anosia means complete absence of the pinna. Uh, it could be just a stubble uh, or it could be a complete absence of the pinna. Um, in uh, well, early days when uh, of um, uh, hand combat and war, uh, there are cases where um, they might somebody might have a laceration of the pinna and completely you lose their pinna. Um, but as I said, um, it's uh, it may not necessarily affect uh, the hearing if the damage is just restricted to the pinna. Often malformations of the pinna can be corrected by cosmetic or plastic surgery. Uh, and such procedures are known as pinnaplasty or autoplasty. There are some conditions that might affect the ear canal. Um, one would be atresia, where there's a, a lack of canalization. Some uh, congenital conditions, uh, such as treacher collins syndrome, for example, uh, might um, um, these individuals might not have uh, an opening or might have only a, a slit hole like opening instead of the ear canal. In some cases it could be um, because of trauma and um, particularly in case um, like significant examples would be like uh, individuals who uh, practice boxing. Uh, they might have this boxer's ear where there might be swelling in the ear canal and it might be significant that it completely shuts off the ear canal. Um, if it's just a narrowing of the ear canal, uh, we call that condition as stenosis. Stenosis refers to just narrowing of the ear canal. Um, and that might that is actually more common. Um, many individuals who, you, who uh, routinely use Q-tips might actually um, traumatize the ear canal um, by using those big Q-tips, uh, which over time might uh, be irritated and uh, swell, resulting in this you know, rather painful condition um, on a stenosis. Um, again, one of the reasons why we should avoid using your uh, Q-tips or earbuds. Um, and then the elderly individuals, just like um, with age, the skin and the rest of the body becomes more um, lax. Uh, such would be the case of the skin and the ear canal too. Um, one of the consequences of that is when we try to put pressure on the pinna, like when we're putting a headphone on, 
it might result in collapsing uh, the air canal, uh, in other words, occluding the air canal. And if you were to test those individuals without this knowledge, it might show up that they have a, a conductive component to the hearing loss. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we would um, uh, particularly use insert earphones for elderly individuals uh, to prevent this hap from happening. So these are some examples of uh, where there's a stenosis of the ear canal here. This is an example where there's an occlusion of the ear canal. In fact, you can see a small bug stuck to it. Uh, this is an example in the bottom where a piece of the Q-tip is left behind. And over time, what would happen is uh, the serum and the wax would start covering that. And that at one point, it might reach uh, um, a complete occlusion of the ear canal, removing um, but in some cases a surgical removal of that um, foreign body. There could be foreign bodies in the ear canal. Often um, you might find kids when you're doing those hearing screenings at preschools or in, in, in kindergarten uh, with beads in the ear or pieces of their pencil eraser. Um, or some cases even bugs. Um, so any condition that affects the uh, ear canal can potentially result in a conductive hearing loss, meaning that the, the problem is in the external uh, ear. And uh, but if you were to bypass that using bone conduction testing, you would find that things are normal. Here's a pardon me. Here's a short video about uh, uh, I believe it's. Uh, a clinic in, in some country in South America where they actually found some maggots um, growing in the year, flies laying eggs and the eggs actually hatching to maggots. So enjoy that video. Conditions that affect the ear canal uh, are known as external otitis. Otitis refers to uh, tice means refers to inflammation and otitis refers to an inflammation of the ear. External otitis, of course, is um, inflammation of the ear canal. Um, a common condition is the swimmer's ears, uh, where the highly chlorinated water or salty water of the sea can result in irritating the ear canal, resulting in inflammation. Um, some of this inflammation might result in a fungal infection known as automycosis. Um, some cases of automycosis could be because of a, a overprotective overuse of eardrops too. Um, automycosis is a painful condition and it's a well, rather smelly condition uh, because fungal infection might have spores in it and um, and actually might result in some cases of a green or yellowish discharge um, that can be, as I said, uh, uh, quite hurtful and uh, smelly. Uh, of course, it's a rather easily treatable condition um, where you need to first uh, irrigate the ear. Irrigation refers to just removal of the, um, the, the fungal uh, parts. Um, and uh, treatment with uh, systematic antibiotics if there is an inflammation. Um, another condition that might uh, uh, that's quite painful is the condition known as foronchlosis. Um, many of you guys might have experienced this foronchlosis in somewhere in your hand or legs, where there's a hair follicle with a polyp um, at the base of it. Um, such might happen even with the hair follicles in the ear canal. Again, this is a painful condition because the skin in your ear canal is uh, quite um, tight. And so if any infection or, uh, that results in extending that uh, is quite painful, uh, especially during jaw movement or when they're trying to chew. Um, um, any of this Conditions that affect the external auditory canal might also affect the tympanic membrane, resulting in inflammation uh, of the tympanic membrane. Uh, Myron Go refers to any term related to the tympanic membrane. And if you're having an infection inflammation of the tympanic membrane, we use the term myringitis.
individuals that have this furunculosis or uh, um, automycosis or, or any inflammation of the ear canal uh, likely will have a conductive hearing loss uh, if it's resulting in that stenosis of the ear canal. Uh, but they might be hard to test, um, especially because of the tenderness that they have uh, of their pinna and the ear canal. So we might have to use um, systematic antibiotics um, and in some cases um, some steroids, um, external steroids to reduce inflammation before um, actually trying to test their hearing. Um, there might be some tumors uh, that are prone to grow in the external um, ear, either in the pinna or in the ear canal. Uh, most of these tumors are benign, uh, but some can be malignant, so any uh, foreign growth on the ear canal needs to be uh, reported and medically um, evaluated. Uh, so that's, that would be the part of the uh, physical examination of the ear um, before you do a toscopy. A common condition, uh, especially in elderly individuals, would be um, almost occluded um, earwax or cerumen. Uh, in elderly individuals, uh, well, all of us uh, from our anatomy of external auditory canal, we know that the external two-third of the ear canal has hair follicles. And one of the uh, role of these hair follicles or cilia is to um, gradually push out the cerumen uh, to the periphery. And when one takes a shower, it's washed away. Um, some conditions like um, an infection or inflammation of the ear canal might preclude this normal process. And, and this is kind of um, particularly the case in elder, elderly individuals where um, there, these hair follicles may not be doing their job as much as they were when they were young, or sung young. So, in, and so these individuals who are prone to ear wax and cerumen, um, you would recommend those uh, wax softeners. And many of them are available over the counter. Um, a few drops of that for a couple of days, and uh, um, it should soften the ear wax to the point that it can be easily removed. Uh, with a curette or it might naturally um, uh, um, be washed away. Again, this might be important uh, for those who are uh, wearing hearing aids because hearing aids, uh, either the ones that sit inside the ear canal or, uh, or those ones that have an ear tip might end up pushing the earwax further in the canal uh, to the part of the ear canal that doesn't have the cilia to do this um, pushing out the wax. And so those individuals you would recommend that they periodically uh, clean the ears with these um, wax solvents, softeners. Because there's a number of conditions that might affect the tympanic membrane. Um, perforation of the tympanic membrane would be like a dramatic um, example. Uh, some of these perforations might be because of trauma. Um, it could be because of being proximal to a, a blast, a pressure wave, or it could be physical trauma. Um, surprisingly, uh, if it was because of uh, one incident trauma, uh, the, these perforations heal pretty, uh, pretty good. However, if the perforation was a a result of a middle ear infection, and then one needs to medically treat the middle ear infection first. And, and if everything is kept dry and um, um, infection is uh, treated, and the tympanic membrane typically might um, might uh, might recover. Um, but often, even when if the tympanic membrane recovers. Um, if a person has a history of ear infections with ear discharge, uh, if you, when you're doing a toscopy, you might notice um, scar tissue on, on the tympanic membrane. And the scar tissue is generally lighter in color than the rest of the tympanic membrane, as in this case over here. Um, in long-standing ear infections uh, that, um, that have not responded well to medical treatment, uh, a surgeon want, might want to go and um, 
patch the kind of hole or perforation. And often that's done with a piece of uh, biological tissue. It could be a muscle fascia. And it could be a piece of the fatty tissue um, just behind the ear or from anywhere else in the body. And, and they place that over the tympanic and the tympanic membrane perforation. And over time it heals to, uh, to patch the tympanic membrane. Uh, conditions that where you try to repair the tympanic membrane is known as myringoplasty. Uh, again, myringo refers to the tympanic membrane, plasty refers to uh, well, surgical uh, cosmetic or plastic surgery. So moving on to some conditions that might affect the middle ear. Uh, here is just a synopsis of some of the conditions that might affect the middle ear. Uh, we just talked about the perforation and uh, a common middle ear condition would be otitis media where there's an infection in the middle ear uh, cavity and um, might result in fluid accumulation behind the tympanic membrane. Uh, some conditions that uh, might affect the ossicular chain directly um, could be trauma. When there's a physical trauma like in traumatic brain injury or head injury cases, and the ossicles might be disrupted or disjointed. And of course, now you don't have this chain uh, to conduct the sound to the inner ear, and that's going to result in a hearing loss. If there's just a mild disruption, often the ossicles heal themselves, just like bones in our rest of the body. Uh, but in some cases where there's a complete uh, detachment, then you might have to have a surgical um, oil intervention where the ossicles are tried to um, connect are tried to connect it back or if there's a complete loss of an ossicle then you might have to re replace that with the prosthesis another common condition that affects the middle ear uh, are seen in the middle ear is this autosclerosis and we'll talk um, a little bit more about that uh, a few slides down but it's a condition that affects the foot plate of the stapes um, and it's characterized by a spongy bony growth um, that kind of um, fixates the stapes to the uh, inner ear uh, wall. Um, the stapes in normal ears uh, is just loosely um, loosely articulates with the with the oval window, but in these cases, uh, it's there's a bony growth almost kind of. Um, gluing the stapes to the uh, inner ear oval window wall. Um, naturally, that's going to reduce the amount of sound going in um, and resulting in a conductive hearing loss to begin with. Autosclerosis is a condition that runs through families. Um, so, um, and one of the things that you might pick up uh, in your case history is if there is a um, a history of hearing loss in in from the mother's side or uh, the maternal side, um, and if uh, and the might the patient might repeat uh, report to you that uh, that was uh, surgically treated. Uh, in many cases, that they report such, uh, it could be a condition known as autosclerosis. This condition of autosclerosis. Another condition that affects the middle ear would be. Um, um, diseases of the East Asian tube. It could concur in many cases it does with the uh, otitis media where there's a disruption um, of the East Asian tube and uh, the East Asian tube not doing its job of ventilating the middle ear. Otitis media is quite common uh, especially before the uh, age of two. Um, there's a very high incidence of um, of this middle ear infection uh, in young children, and partly it's because of the well, natural uh, normal anatomy, where the eustachian tube of uh, children are is more flat and it, it tends to be more uh, it's more prone to be open than closed, um, so there's more likely that the infections, are, I mean, germs that reach the oral cavity going into the middle ear cavity and resulting in the ear infection. Uh, 
and uh, you might see uh, Titus media also in adults um, because of barrel trauma or because of scuba diving for example uh, where there's sudden pressure uh, changes that the eustachian tube cannot um, uh, adapt and it's not uh, doing its job essentially in otitis media um, it's an infection of the mucus lining of the middle ear compartment um, the otitis the middle ear is uh, covered by this mucus membrane uh, just like the mucus membrane in one's uh, inside one's nose and uh, it's a moist um, membrane that needs to be uh, periodically um, kind of ventilated and cleaned and that was the role of the eustachian tube and if the eustachian tube is not doing that job uh, then there is a tendency for that uh, mucous membrane to get infected uh, resulting in this otitis media uh, some syndrome uh, syndromatic cases are more prone to this um, otitis media examples would be treacher collins again or uh, down syndrome uh, where there's some anatomical deformities making the middle ear more exposed to infection. Uh, cases where uh, there's an immune deficiency, like in uh, autoimmune deficiency uh, syndrome, AIDS, uh, are also prone to more middle ear infections. And it's, it's known that children who are exposed to ch cigarette smoke or fumes uh, are also uh, there's a high prevalence of otitis media so in otitis media the infection usually starts at the nasopharynx uh, in other words the opening of the eustachian tube in the oral cavity and the infection spreads up the tube um, and as it progresses in uh, the eustachian tube gets swollen and shut uh, and now the infection is kind of locked inside the middle ear compartment uh, Typically, uh, if you were to test a patient at that stage, you are going to get uh, a tympanogram uh, that shifted to the negative side. Uh, so the peak tympanometric peak pressure would be significantly negative, and we're going to be more than minus 100 um, decapascals. But as infection progresses, um, and if there is fluid um, getting lodged inside the middle ear compartment, um, the tympanic membrane might get more stiff and uh, eventually the tympanogram might um, be flat uh, because of immobility of the tympanic membrane. There's different types of otitis media. The most common one is the superative, uh, superative otitis media. Uh, this includes um, there might be pus or blood uh, in the middle ear cavity. Uh, and these are cases where when you look at, uh, through otoscopy, when you look at the tympanic membrane, you might even see like air bubbles um, on the tympanic membrane. Um, and that would be a case of separate of otitis media. These conditions can be chronic. In other words, they could occur um, uh, frequently. Or it could be acute, uh, where there's an acute uh, inflammation, redness of the tympanic membrane, and and it, and it's treatable, uh, responds well to treatment, medical treatment, such as antibiotics. So naturally, when you test these individuals, you're going to get a conductive hearing loss. It's going to be a flat conductive hearing loss. And uh, if you were to bypass the the middle ear and directly check the inner ear using bone uh, oscillator, you would find that the thresholds are within normal limits. And most conductive hearing loss cases, it's a loss of sensitivity. Uh, in other words, you're going to see, uh, but they won't be able to hear soft sounds, but if it was made loud enough and uh, if the sound reaches the inner ear, things might return to normal. So they might have good word recognition skills. And this is in contrast to individuals who might have a sensory neural hearing loss where typically not only there is a loss of sensitivity in other words there is a degree of hearing loss they also might uh, have a distortion uh, of the material of the speech or sound inside the ear and so even if you make it louder their word recognition scores might be uh, poor 
So coming back to otitis media, the tympanogram, um, if it's progressed, it will be flat. In other words, the static acoustic admittance uh, compliance is lower than what you would expect um, for normals. In the PowerPoint uh, version of this lecture, um, in the slides, I'm going to be adding some audiograms uh, that you might that's typically seen with these uh, conditions. So uh, I urge you guys to look at those PowerPoint slides and also visit these hyperlinks that has some videos um, related to these conditions. Untreated uh, chronic otitis media can result in uh, some complications. One such complication is uh, facial nerve uh, paralysis. Um, if the if you recollect from our anatomy, we know that the facial nerve uh, traverses or travels through the middle ear compartment. In fact, the facial nerve is what innervates the stapedius muscle. Um, so if there is a long-standing ear infection, it actually might result in infecting the facial nerve uh, and resulting in a facial paralysis in that side of the face. Uh, some cases of Bell's palsy, which is a, a common uh, type of facial paralysis, uh, could be because of um, a history of otitis media. Uh, other complications of otitis media could be uh, this infection invading the there's air spaces in the mastoid bone, uh, resulting in a condition known as mastoiditis. Uh, again, mastoiditis refers to in, referring to an infection, in this case, the infection of the mastoid air space. The mastoid air cells are porous. It's, it's the only part of the, uh, uh, the bone, the temporal bone, that is uh, lighter because it's got uh, air cavities inside. But that also makes it prone to for those infections to getting lodged in. Um, so these are cases where, um, again, it's been a long-standing ear infection, uh, and uh, often the this, uh, the ENT might have to resort to uh, completely removing the uh, infected mastoid part. Mastoid part. Um, it's considered a radical surgery where the mastoid um, bone is um, uh, it's kind of uh, irrigated and. Uh, uh, and to remove all the infection. So those are cases where if you encounter them, uh, they may not have that natural shaped dome uh, behind their their pinna. It almost seem like uh, palpable and soft. And, and if you haven't heard from the patient already, uh, you would uh, find out that they have had this mastoiditis and uh, um, a condition known as mastoidectomy, where the mastoid bone was removed. Um, Long-standing ear infections can also have more severe consequences, um, such as meningitis. Uh, again, the menin meningitis refers to those delicate coverings of the brain. And uh, if you recollect the anatomy of the middle ear, you'll find that the middle ear compartment is actually quite close to this um, uh, the brain cavity. So in some cases, um, it could result in the erosion of the bone that separates the middle ear compartment and uh, the brain and might result in this meningitis, uh, which could be life-threatening um, and, and needs to be treated immediately. Again, if the infection has been, uh, middle ear infections have been occurring quite frequently, and has resulted in some complications. Uh, and if it doesn't treat well with antibiotics, um, then you might need uh, surgical intervention. Uh, a common surgical intervention could be placement of those PE tubes, PE standing for pressure equalization tubes, um, that are placed um, on the tympanic membrane with the idea of ventilating the middle ear space. Um, they come in different colors now. Um, many of them are actually fluorescent, uh, green or orange. And uh, often when you happen to find yourself being involved in some preschool hearing screenings, you might see um, children who have those tubes. 
Um, again, uh, if the mastoid bone has been infected, you might have to have this mastoidectomy, which refers to the scraping of the mastoid bone. Uh, tympanoplasty refers to any surgical um, intervention on the on the tympanic cavity or in the middle ear. Uh, again, long-standing ear infections might erode the bone, including the ossicles. So you might, uh, the surgeon might resort to uh, removing completely the ossicles and placing prostheses, um, and that would be uh, considered a tympanoplasty procedure. So the eustachian tube can be uh, abnormal in some cases. Uh, as I said, most of the early stages of an ear infection, a middle ear infection, could be because of an abnormal eustachian tube. Uh, but there are also cases where the eustachian tube is chronically open. Um, and so uh, and those are the conditions that we call a spatulous uh, eustachian tube. Um, these people, it could be because of surgery, um, either the removal of the tonsils or adenoids are because of some tympanoplasty surgery, that the muscles that actually keep the eustachian tube closed uh, do not work well, so they, they, the, the eustachian tube is chronically open. Uh, this may not necessarily result in a hearing loss, but of course it makes the middle ear compartment open to infections. Uh, these individuals that have this condition, patellar eustachian tube, often uh, report that they their speech sounds like um, uh, like in a head in a barrel, because now it's not uh, the speech sounds that you make. The one's own speech um, is not attenuated, reduced by this closed eustachian tube, and it reaches in the middle ear directly. Um, you might actually find normal. Uh, tympanograms on these people uh, but however if you ask them to breathe uh, you might see that the, the tympanic membrane actually uh, vibrates uh, in other words it's sucked in and pushed out for each breath cycle and when if you if we were to do tympanograms you'll see that the, the tympanometric peak pressure keeps fluctuating between positive and negative Again, one of the common uh, middle ear conditions that you might see that runs through a family is this autosclerosis. It's actually uh, a bone, uh, a condition that affects a bony labyrinth of the inner ear, but often it starts by um, as a spongy bony growth uh, at the foot plate of the stapes. Uh, this condition is progressive in nature, and um, and it's it's related to some hormonal changes, and so it's commonly seen in uh, Caucasian women, especially during uh, when there's dramatic hormonal shifts, such as in uh, pregnancy or in menopause. Um, again, it starts as a bony growth, that uh, that spongy bony growth that um, kind of fixates the stapes into the oval window. So it begins as a conductive hearing loss, and uh, if it was identified early and um, um, through some medical surgical intervention, um, uh, many people do well. However, if it's left untreated, um, it actually might result in uh, invading the inner ear and, uh, and the hearing loss might progress from a conductive hearing loss to a mixed hearing loss. Okay, so if you were to do putronodiometry, you would find that uh, they have a significant airborne gap, especially in those initial stages. Now, what's interesting is um, you might have, uh, even if there's a conductive hearing loss, the bone conduction hearing, particularly at 2000 hertz, might be notched. In other words, it might be a, kind of a steep hearing loss, particularly at 2000 hertz. Um, and that's what we call as a Carhartt's notch. And it's kind of an important sign uh, for the sclerosis, uh, and that's because of the immobility of the stapes. Uh, 
A tympanogram for a patient with autosclerosis might show reduced tympanic membrane movement. Again, that's because of the stiffness in the ossicular chain because of that bony growth. Often you might have to resort to a surgical treatment uh, to uh, treat autosclerosis. And the procedure that's commonly done is known as tepidectomy. Uh, dectomy refers to any removal. So in this case, the stapes uh, in fact, uh, is removed and it's replaced by a prosthesis. Um, and either could be just a small prosthesis instead of the stapes, like in this case over here, uh, or it could be uh, the complete ossicular chain. Uh, it's being replaced by a prosthesis that connects the tympanic membrane to the oval window directly. As I said, in, in cases where um, it's not diagnosed early or uh, because of some reason surgical intervention was not possible, uh, then it, it, it's going to progress to a mixed hearing loss. So in those cases, if the mixed, uh, in the mixed hearing loss, if the sensor neural hearing loss, in other words, if the bone conduction threshold is significantly affected, uh, then one might have to um, uh, limit themselves with hearing aids. Um, so hearing aids might be an option to, um, to improve their hearing. So other conditions that affect the middle ear include, uh, again, tumors growing inside the middle ear space. It could be uh, disarticulation or trauma to the ossicles. Um, they also might result in uh, a conductive hearing loss because of a problem in the middle ear.